First, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's truly a flattering thing and an honor to speak to humanists. Sometimes I find myself not speaking to humanists so much, and it is sometimes not as good. So um, I wanted to also thank all the participants in the seminar today who were there at 9 o'clock and on, and, and the papers were just of such uniformly high quality. It was just remarkable. I mean, every paper just sang with intelligence, and it was an inspiration. But I know that you've been here all day, so I have a lot of clips which is the upside. The downside is that they're all extremely offensive. <laughs> so um, I've been studying race on the internet for 15 years, as well as homophobia, sexism, and so on. And what struck me is how nonchalant people have become about the pervasive hate speech that's found online. Um, as, you know, as was said already, the internet has become a pervasive medium. It really is you know, everywhere. And so I'm going to be narrowing down my focus to talk about basically three parts of it. Um, one is the world of Xbox Live. Does anybody play Xbox Live? The little Halo, Modern Warfare, okay. Well, these are really, really popular games. I mean, tremendously so. Uh, when Modern Warfare Black Ops came out, it wasn't just one of the biggest um, game, video game releases. I mean, it topped all video game releases, huge amounts of money. It was one of the biggest media releases. You know, enormous revenue was generated in rel a relatively short amount of time. Um, maybe three or four days, because it's a global medium, right? Everybody buys it at the same time. Um, so they're economically consequential, and they're socially consequential as well. I think that people tend to write off in-game racism in these media because they think that it's 18 to 25-year-old guys who will grow out of it. But in fact, that's not true. I mean, the average game buyer and game player is well into his 30s. People don't stop playing games when they get older. Instead, they just play different games sometimes. They switch to other kinds of platforms. So this is certainly not a niche thing. Um, I'm also going to be talking a little bit about Twitter, um, social, what people have been calling um, social awareness tool. Right? So it's more about getting short 140 character bits of information all day long from all kinds of people. And I'm going to be talking about 4chan which is a group of anonymous, some people are laughing because they know what 4chan is. Um, it's an anonymous bulletin board. It's the biggest image board in the world. And it's been the source of some tremendously interesting and positive activities lately. Um, a group called Anonymous um, took down parts of Amazon and parts of some credit card companies to protest Julia Assange's being in jail. And they've also been able to take down various repressive governmental parts of repressive governmental websites. On the other hand, other groups in 4chan have done tremendously racist stuff. So, um, so I'll, I'm going to start with a disclaimer that there's a lot of really ugly language of what I'm going to be showing you. And part of what I want to talk about is the desensitization that people have to this. But beyond that, I think beyond the tolerance for it, um, there's something in operation that I'm calling enlightened racism. I don't mean enlightened in the sense that it's better than the old racism. Right. Um, in no way do I mean that. What I'm doing is picking up Enlightened Sexism, which came out earlier last year, I believe. Has anybody seen this book? It's a good book. It's really nice. So I'm just going to read really quickly um, how she defines Enlightened um, Sexism. And I started this, I was going <laughs> to, I started this section, is the post and post racial, the post and post feminist um, kind of 90s nod to post colonialism, post structuralism. Um, Racism and sexism as guilty pleasures online. The paradox of racism online can be summed up as follows. We are currently in a moment of enlightened racism, a term I'm taking from Susan Douglas's enlightened sexism. As she writes, enlightened sexism, sexism is, quote, a response, deliberate or not, to the perceived threat of a new gender regime. It insists that women have made plenty of progress because of feminism. Indeed, full equality has allegedly been achieved, so now it's okay, even amusing, to resurrect sexist stereotypes of girls and women. As Douglas writes, quote, enlightened sexism takes the gains of the women's movement as a given and then uses them as permission to, to resurrect retrograde images of girls and women as sex objects, bimbos, and hoochie mamas, still defined by their appearance and biological destiny. Um, so she's thinking of things like the man show which I don't even know is on the air anymore, but it was this overtly kind of chauvinist show. It showed show you know, women um, in tube tops being bounced up and down on blankets and so on. Um, it was over the top, sexist, tongue in cheek, right? It was understood that it was ridiculous to have bikini clad women jumping on trampolines and the guys who wanted to do this were morons. 
Therefore, the objectification of women is now fine. Why, it's actually a joke on the guys, as Susan Douglas says. It's silly to be sexist. Therefore, it's funny to be sexist. And we all know that the real currency on the internet is not cash, it's attention. Or humor is another way to get attention. Enlightened racism is a form of racist behavior and speech only available to those who are known not to be racist. That's why it's okay for media products like the film Tropic Thunder, television programs like South Park and The Office, and the humor of Sarah Silverman to contain or at times be based upon overt racism and sexism. For in Mary Beltran's words, let's let them both both skewer and it sometimes appear nostalgic for ethnic and racial stereotypes. I think Mad Men is kind of in that territory as well. Um, this is what she calls post-racial humor. And it's important that only humor can deploy race in this way. Um, and as I'm going to talk about here, a lot of the griefing um, that happens, you know, really racist, sexist, homophobic harassment of other players is written off as um, humor. Right? or as strategy, one or the other, trash talking or humor. It's never expressive, it's really instrumental. Right? I'm calling you this name because I want you to play worse so I can win, or because I'm trying to bother you because that's my goal. It's never about this is what I mean or this is what I think. Therefore, much of the racism and sexism that you see in what I'm going to show you is really about the disavowal that play permits. Right? The, the circle of play, I think you've had some speakers who talked about the magic circle, is a space of disavowal. Right, it's a space separate from the ordinary um, kind of morals and ethics that we normally expect. And some of you, this is a side of renewal. Right? It's a way to leave behind the problems we've got. Um, I think I'm viewing it more as a site to, to really amplify those problems because they're protected by this magic circle. So paradoxically, the worse racism and sexism are, the more extreme and cartoonish they are, the more hard they are to take seriously Indeed, as Rosalind Gill puts it, quote, the extremeness of the sexism is evidence there's no sexism. If there is no more sexism, then there is no longer a need for sexual politics, and sexual politics can be mocked and attacked. The N-word is funny in some contexts because it is so extreme that nobody could really mean it, and humor is all about not meaning it. However, post-racial humor is a confusing discursive mode. <laughs> Um, people are sometimes unable to separate enlightened racism from regular garden variety racism. And I would claim there's no difference. Right? To me, there is no difference. Um, Douglas was unable to persuade some of her younger readers of her thesis about enlightened sexism, as in regards to the man show, say. Um, she was reviewed by Bust Magazine, a publication that's post feminist, right? Younger feminist. And they hated her argument, and they hated her book. They said, quote, part of the problem lies in the book's broad scope. Douglas encompasses pop culture from the 90s to the present in order to define the millennial generation, but the resulting effect is repetitive. Unfortunately, the majority of the book feels painfully like hearing your mom's, one's mom, in this case, a feminist Annie DeFranco-loving mom, shaking her finger at your favorite guilty pleasures, being a buzzkill. Being bothered by overt sexism is a sure sign of the generation gap. Your mother's feminism is identified as such by its inability to take a joke. Internet memes are nothing if not guilty pleasures. Media forums that are users defined by their occasion of consumption, known as, quote, bored at work media. Inconsequential, without substance. Likewise, sexism and racism are bundled along as inconsequential guilty pleasures. So now I'm going to play a short clip from NPR. This came out right after Modern Warfare 2 was released, not um, Black Ops, but the one before that, which was a huge blockbuster. So let me just. Discussed as much 
but the actual game reasons themselves. You're not talking about what comes from the game. You're talking about what the players say as they are playing the game. Exactly. It's all about the actual online interaction of players in this virtual world. But it almost seems to me that what you're describing is an atmosphere that gives rise to, uh, let's say, the verbal equivalent of a bar fight without any physical risk. People start getting abusive and insulting and they're disappointed in what's happening in the game. And on the other hand, the person they're insulting could be 5,000 miles away. Exactly. I think that's a great analogy. There's no physical consequence when you are sitting on a couch talking into a headset and the person that you could be offending or verbally assaulting could be thousands of miles away. Now, I think a lot of non-gamers right now are they're wondering, uh, in an environment in which the game is <coughs> Uh, it, it seems almost quite to worry about what people are saying as they're killing the uncivilized. Yeah, I definitely think the content of the game lends itself to that sort of aggressive behavior. But you do find this sort of uh, thing happening in sporting games and in other games where there's a heavy sort of competition. In the head of the heat of the moment, people become very passionate. And unfortunately, it does sort of lend itself to these sort of negative results. Well, if the problem is uh, not so much with the video games, as you see it, as with the gamers, is there anything that the uh, video game companies can do or are doing uh, to try to discourage this? There are things, and the most popular online uh, internet service, which is called Xbox Live, does have an entire section of their department devoted to combat that sort of behavior online. And uh, I was able to talk with the uh, head of that department for Microsoft's Xbox Live. And players can take action against those people who are violating their terms of service, whether it be misogynistic tones or racist, what have you. There are rules in place. There are provisions that allow you to report these incidents that happen. I'm not quite sure I follow this. I'm not a gamer. But if I'm playing a game and there's some player whom I only know of the polar bear uh, and he's doing a racist invective uh, at me or any player. Can I call in the rep somewhere in Microsoft at that moment in real time and say this whoever this is, this polar bear, shouldn't be allowed to play? You absolutely can. However, that sort of mandate will not come down until the powers that be at Microsoft <coughs> investigate the situation. So there really is no sort of instant gratification, sort of uh, the ban comes down right away. It's something that the heads at Xbox will have to take into consideration after they've reviewed all elements of the incident. So to answer your question, no, there's no way to do it in real time. You can file a complaint in real time. However, it won't be addressed until some hours after. Jeff, thank you, John. My pleasure. It's Jeff Backlund, video games at the website CNET. Okay. I think if NPR is talking about this, it must mean that they've finally kind of gotten the memo about online video games, as they say, and racism. Um, it's no s surprise to anyone, really, that racism and sexism are very common in video games. Um, but as the NPR story reminds us, that talk or that discourse on the platform of those games is far less studied than the violent content of the games themselves. So people are far more concerned about screen violence than they are about interactions between players. Um, yet the interactions between players are the great draw of social games like Modern Warfare 2 or World of Warcraft. That's why they've done so well. And the impact of words uttered between players is surely as important as the visual, procedural, or oral milieu of the games themselves. In fact, you could say that's what players are doing. They're making those things on the fly. Games are platforms for game interaction and are coming to constitute spheres of identity formation for users both young and old. As I mentioned before, people think of video gamers as being teenage boys, but the average age of a gamer is well into their 30s. Um, so in this paper, I'm going to be talking about how gamic cultures of incivility are perpetuating social inequalities and how the pervasive use of hate speech within them is part and parcel of an increased tolerance for such language and behavior on other channels of the Internet as well as in everyday life. And I'm going to be talking about Twitter in particular. Indeed, different platforms such as Internet platforms such as online games, Twitter, and the web are now identified with different kinds of racial and sexual harassment. As American humorist and blogger Christian Lander 
author of the well-known blog, Things White People Like, tweeted during an internet humor conference I attended in 2010, racism is for the internet, homophobia is for Xbox Live. <laughs> and I'm going to be showing that, in fact, all of these things are everywhere. But it's true that Halo in particular is known for the word fag being used constantly, with incredible homophobia. Yet rather than despairing of games in spaces where racism and sexism flourish unchecked, it makes more sense to see this as an opportunity to understand why this is happening, who it is serving, and who it is harming. It's not hard to find examples. I didn't have to look very hard at all. It's not even that productive to condemn it in my mind. And there's a recent anthology called The Offensive Internet by Saul Levmore and Martha Nussbaum through Harvard University Press that covers some of the same ground. It's by law professors. And they want to talk about the harms of online harassment, what they're calling cyberbullying or the cyber cesspool, homophobia, the cyber mob, and so on, and ways to prove material and also psychological harm, bad climate, and how to regulate this kind of speech. Um, I'm a you know, person who used the internet in the 90s. I'm not especially for regulation. That's not really what I'm here to talk about. But rather, how it is that racist discourse is strategic, how it happens for a reason, what the reasons are. Again, as I mentioned before, racism and sexism, homophobia online are not really expressive modes. They're instrumental modes, as they are in everyday life. In other words, people will often say, I didn't mean it when they're caught out calling someone a fag and word, you know, um, a bitch or whatever. And they really mean that. They didn't mean it. It was something that occurred as a way to do some other thing. Um, and I'm glad I have so many humanist people here because often this is under the sign of irony, right? I didn't mean it is, you know, paradigmatically about irony. I have distance. Why don't you have distance? You, you're the problem, not me, right? Get some distance. That's often the attitude that's taken here. Um, so I'm very attached to this phrase, don't hate the player, hate the game, which is, um, I think, Jamie Foxx from a few years ago, right? Because I want to stress that I'm not um, condemning the people who do this necessarily, right? I'm trying to talk about how this is an institutional and technological structure which permits or encourages this kind of behavior under the sign of disavowal, irony, instrumentality, right? So um, as a lot of software scholars have been telling us, if we want to look at the internet or games as visual phenomena, we're going to miss most of what's important. Because the reason games are more inter interesting and enticing to viewers than art, say, or than um, graphic novels is that they're not just things to look at, they're things to do. Um, as Ian Bogo says in his um, rhetoric of game studies, games are procedural. They are not about expression, they're about activity. What happens when you do this? So what are the feedbacks or what are the results when certain um, events are triggered in a game, right? That's what games make, what makes games appealing, which is why even extremely low bandwidth or really visually unsophisticated games like Drop 7 or Tetris can be tremendously engaging, right? Because it really is about the interactivity or the procedure, the procedural rhetoric of the game. Um, so racism and sexism within games are procedural as well. They are meant to trigger or execute in the language of software engineering rather than simply to look, right? Instead of being a visual kind of screen um, that conceals something else, instead they are, you could see, part of a script, a way of doing something online. This is how most people talk about it when they explain why they did it. Okay. So I'm going to show, oops, I missed a slide. Huh. Okay. So I'm going to show you um, a short interview with um, Quinton Jackson, also known as Rampage. Are any of you mixed martial arts fans here? Nobody? Okay, sorry. Um, when Halo 2 came out, I think in 2005, um, there were many dedicated video game players who were very excited. I mean, Halo 2 was a great game, right? It really solidified Xbox's current dominance in network gaming, which is a huge, huge market, you know? We got rid of our cable, now we all, have is the X, all we have is the Xbox. It's replaced our cable set, it's replaced our DVD, it's replaced, you know, does all these things. So that was all started, you could say, by um, having a tentpole game property, which was Halo. So when Halo 2 came out, multiplayer, very exciting event. However, um, fans like Quentin Jackson um, had a kind of unpleasant surprise. So I'll play it for you. I'm a first time I knew her. I was pregnant. And I did something. And he said, It's a theater in here! Get out of the theater! And he said, I didn't know what 
Jackson Rampage did for Dub Magazine, and it really didn't get out very much. It was kind of a um, on the download kind of thing. Um, and what's interesting here is the chiasmus of the usual formulation of first-person shooter video games, which is what Halo is. Um, first-person shooter video games are represented as spaces where the 125-pound weakling can, through practice and dedication and skill, become a mighty warrior. Right? You can skill up. You can, you know, pwn anybody who plays. And here's the opposite. Right? A mighty warrior who, when playing Halo, is the victim of such intense racism, he becomes a victim. Right? And so the follow-up to this clip is that he quit playing. He couldn't take it. Right? Not only was, were other teams victimizing him, but his own team would do so as well. Um, I'm interested as well in, in the use of the N-word here. Um, as Randall Jackson, or Randall um, Kennedy, in his book of the same name, says, that is probably the most socially consequential word in our language. Um, and it's also a word that's become euphemistic since 1995. In 1995, reporters had to cover the O.J. Simpson trial and to report what people involved in the trial, such as Mark Furman, said. And they had to interview him. And so this became a way to write what he had said without reproducing the word. And ever since then, it's become really strongly, um, I would say it's replaced the, the other word that it's supposed to say. In fact, I can barely say it. Um, when Randall Kennedy has given interviews on this book, in fact, um, radio announcers have told him he couldn't say it, and they couldn't say it either. So on the one hand, the word has got much more power in some respects than it's ever had. Yet it's used more promiscuously than it's ever been, um, even in what we consider to be our greatest cultural achievements on television, such as The Wire, where it's really, really promiscuously used. So it's an incredible paradox, linguistically incredibly powerful, um, as uh, some people have noticed, in the schools, there's a recommendation to edit Huckleberry Finn so as to replace that word with the word slave. Um, Kennedy reports a child he knew coming home to his parent and saying, um, you know, we read a book about inward gym. And they said, inward gym? Like contemplative gym? Thoughtful gym? What's inward gym? And then he realized that he was talking about Huckleberry Finn. And this was the way the whole class was talking about the book. So while that word has is, is almost become evacuated from everyday speech, even from education, it is totally alive in the online world, absolutely present, very, very vital, and as I'll show you, absolutely disavowed in many ways at the same time. So as Christian Lander says, um, homophobia is for the Internet, racism is for the Internet, homophobia is for Xbox Live. Obviously, racism is on Xbox Live as well, but there is a special way that Xbox Live and Halo, and I'm going to show you a clip from a Halo 3 incident, um, really is very much a part of that culture of griefing there. Um, Halo 3, uh, you know, another tremendously important um, franchise for Microsoft, uh, has got many, many, many players. And a person who chose to give themselves the gamer tag or nickname XXGayBoyXX went online and took um, clips of what happened when he was playing with people um, in, in the game. People he didn't know, which is often how people play. Um, and I'll just show you what happened. Hey, Daddy boy, are you a man or what? Hey, boy, I hope you die for a 
hey boy, I don't remember you from a long time ago. You do. Yeah. Hey, my friend kept killing you and sea bagging you. But I heard you did it. You did it all wrong. Dude, we should get one on the dude. Yeah, I'm going to be. Hey, hey boy, what's the name of the cocky over there? If that's not going to be able to speak on the phone, all the time. YouTube clip and it had engendered five YouTube responses, which is actually quite a lot. And in it, not a few people um, just wanted to know why would you choose that name, right? This is a disembodied space where everybody's avatar looks more or less the same. There's not a lot of customization you can do in Halo 3. One of the only things you can choose is your name. Why would you purposely choose a name like Gay Boy, right? Um, and so there was a sense that if you have the technological capability to make yourself, the consequences of making yourself in this way really rest upon you as the player. Um, so the valid, the, this idea of a supposedly race and gender free self reflects a really neoliberal ideological position, um, one that celebrates freedom, progress, and individualism, and defines citizenship as the civic duty of individuals to reduce their burden on society, <laughs> build up their own human capital to be entrepreneurs of themselves, which is from Iowa Ong. Digital profiles and avatars that are produced by users encourage the sense that one is producing oneself without any kind of limitation. Obviously, in you know, Xbox, Halo, you're going to be a guy, and most of the people playing it are guys. Um, however, there's often a really narrow range of faces, bodies, and features that one can take on. Often they're conventionally physically attractive, often white, default, or male. Um, however, even when people are given the same bodies as was Quentin Jackson or are given the opportunity to choose their names as was this player, um, these are incredible moments of racism and sexism which are then blamed upon the individual for not making themselves correctly, right? for not making the right decisions, improving their human capital in such a way that reduces conflict. So the onus becomes on the individual, again, as is the neoliberal position. Um, as Jeff Bacalar said for CNET, basically Microsoft isn't really enforcing any regulation here. Right? They're doing it, but it's often after the fact. Um, when I've reported violations in World of Warcraft and inquired about what happened, I played World of Warcraft for two years for my next book, just to let you know. Um, I was told we, they could not tell us the result of my grievance because they had to preserve the, identity, the privacy of the other player. So something may have happened, but there's no way I'll ever know whether this was enforced because their privacy had to be protected by not letting me know. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to talking about Twitter. Um, this was something, an incident that happened at an, a conference called RaffleCon, which I already talked about. Christian Lander attended it. He made this interesting observation about racism is for the internet, homophobia is for Xbox Live, and it was a raid by 4chan as I mentioned before. 4chan is a, um, is a group of people who meet up on this website called 4chan.org and do a bunch of sometimes really interesting and, and creative and sometimes really destructive things. Um, and so I'll show you what happened. Um, Twitter had an active, there's an active Twitter stream for this conference. And so I took some screenshots from the Twitter stream to show you what happened. 
Um, around the time of the keynote address, somebody posted this on the Twitter stream. And Moot was the name of one of the keynote speakers who was on that panel. He is the founder of 4chan. So this was a way to hassle him. So you see that. Um, here's another one. And you can see there's two actually right here. Um, the Twitter stream, this is from Twapper Keeper, which is an archiver, just takes everything in chronological order. So these things are just in the order that they happened. There's another one, anontalk.com owns you. So owning up to who's doing this. Um, there's another one. Yeah, um, somebody posted about the racism that was going on in this thread. And this is what happened as a result. So I think I have my slides out of order. Oh yeah, so right here, this one right here, they get little twerps who think they are so cool repeating the misogyny and racism they see on 4chan. So in reply to her, you had this woman belongs in the kitchen. Okay, yeah. So this Twitter stream was moderated by the people running the conference because they probably knew this was going to happen, but everybody who had, it was rather it wasn't, it wasn't projected on the big screen like this, everybody who had a phone or a computer could see it though. And so as you can see, there's lots and lots of this happening. Um, one of the keynote speakers was an African American guy, um, Kenyatta Cheese from Know Your Meme. Um, but the fact he was on the panel didn't seem to, you know, um, didn't seem to be the reason this was happening. It really was a way to bother Moot, who is the um, leader of 4chan. And it was, um, it's very much a part of a group that claims a lot of ownership for doing things like this. So I'll just show you. Um, it's an example of griefing in Second Life. And this is a trophy video taken by that organization, which is called the Patriotic and Words Right. Okay, so if you have ever used Second Life, you know it's not this. This is Second Life being hacked by members of this group, which are, you know, associated with 4chan. And Rainbow Tiger is the name of a gay club in Second Life. So they basically destroyed that club by filling the whole space with boxes and making everybody leave. Um, so what's the problem with this kind of behavior, right? The reference to fur fags are um, gay people or gay players or players with gay avatars who like to create animal avatars um, and do things with each other. So in latent racism online, be it in the form of 4chan n-word raids, racist speech or minstrelsy in MMOs, or this, a pogrom against fur fags, creates a climate that demeans people of color by giving them no recourse to resistance. It's a durable mean that's not confined to the internet, but thrives there as a form of griefing, particularly in communities where humor is the most valuable form of currency, this is a way of hacking the attention economy, right? getting all the attention for yourself. Um, the viral spread of enlightened racism online extends beyond users and into industry products. Um, the problem is that it's very difficult to check this without flying in the face of the internet culture itself. The ultimate justification for any act is humor. Humor rules in the worlds of anonymous online communities like Twitter, 4chan, Modern Warfare, or WoW. If a viewer is offended, they are sometimes told in no uncertain terms to grow up, which I was told many times for telling people in World of Warcraft they're being offensive, to leave it alone, to be an adult. An absolutely paradoxical admonition that makes perfect sense when viewed through the lens of enlightened racism. Critics of enlightened racism or sexism online find themselves cast in the ungrateful role of the buzzkill, a helicopter mother, as Susan Douglas was kind of described as, or worse yet, the humorless oldster, who hopelessly noobish and not to be regarded as an authority on the internet. 
This makes it very difficult to mitigate enlightened racism online, for by protesting it, one becomes unqualified to protest it. Right? You don't understand the culture. You're from the outside. As Douglas writes about enlightened sexism, quote, it is essential that feminism be repudiated as something young women should shun as old-fashioned, withered, humorless, repulsive. Likewise, nobody at RafaelCon said anything about the N-word raid, nobody, for everyone knew what it was, and everybody knew that outrage is the oxygen of griefer communities. To speak of it is to encourage it, to give it life. Since protest was rendered impossible by the cultural context of internet humor, this is how enlightened racism and sexism managed to survive and to proliferate. I brought it up to some people and everyone said, you know, there's no, if you, if you talk about it, you're really doing their work for them. Let's just leave it alone. Don't feed the trolls. Um, this is a different, okay. So, however, there was one lone tweet, as I showed you here, regarding racism in the Twitter stream um, by I.M. Connor, who wrote of Christina Zhu, who is the Asian moderator for the keynote, that this woman belongs in the kitchen. And this was criticized later on by someone who wrote, these little twerps think they're so cool for repeating the misogyny and racism they see in 4chan. So um, I'm going to conclude now. Obviously, there's way more examples that could be talked about here. But what I'm interested in is this idea that racism and sexism have now become trash talk. Right? That's the way Quentin Jackson described it, trash talk, meaning it's inconsequential. Um, an attorney would call it low-value speech. Right? However, I would argue that trash talk is extremely consequential because people view it as a space of exemption, a space of freedom where you are not really responsible for what you're saying because it's instrumental talk. However, all talk is instrumental talk. All talk is expressive talk. And so I want to question that distinction that's being made in hopes of somehow trying to redeem some of this culture. Thank you. playing these games and they have no idea right. this is what they're like. You just see the kid in the headset. A question, you know. a question please uh, raise your hand. That is such a deep question, I have no idea how to answer it. I think the civil rights movement's had a go at that one. Um, <laughs> didn't manage to finish the job. Um, well, when you say that it's about transgression and the pleasure of transgression, I wouldn't necessarily say that because there are lots of other ways to be transgressive that are not this way. I think it's about you know doing a specific activity, which is getting everyone to pay attention to you. And in the case of this you know, N-word raid, I think that the reason that word was chosen and devoid of reference to anyone, right? It wasn't like Quentin Jackson where they're listening to his black voice and saying, and, 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 and right? Um, and it wasn't like gay boy where they're looking at him and saying, you're a gay boy. It was just free floating N word, just out there. And that's because the word in and of itself, as Kennedy has said, is the most transgressive thing you can do. And I think the example is really about how um, it's, it's not because it's racist, it's to get the attention, right? And racism is the most effective way to do that, still, right? That is probably the most effective way to do it. So people reading their Twitter stream as they're walking down this, you know, walking around as, as was, they were doing and drinking coffee, like, oh, right? <laughs> when they saw it, and then they saw it eight more times, they stopped doing that. So that's what it's about. It's about getting a specific kind of reaction, getting all the attention. Um, but it's not okay, and it's not right that that's the way to do it. So I wouldn't say it's, it's necessarily transgressive. There's lots of other ways to be that, 
right? Lock all the bathroom doors or switch the genders on the bathroom doors, which I remember from the 80s. That's transgressive. <laughs> um, but this is something else, right? I think it's exploiting the incredible power of a word which we can neither say nor not say. You know, it's articulated constantly on Xbox Live, like all the time, as you can see, no problem, yet cannot even be uttered by me or anyone, <laughs> it seems, in public discourse. So. Um, I won't stand up. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, it was wonderful. And I was really struck by not only the languages of uh, misogyny and racism and homophobia that you mentioned, but also the undercurrent of ageism that seems to be all the time about mm -hmm. how the, the figure of the mother would be used as an apparatus to describe a sort of get out of jail free card in some way. Mm -hmm. But what I actually wanted to ask you about um, was to take you back to the question of irony with which you, mm -hmm. you opened mm -hmm. your, your theoretical reading of these very distressing texts, very distressing moments. And it strikes me that there is at least one lineage for this particular kind of irony. I mean, there are obviously many lineages, but one that really strikes me as really important is the lineage of something called stand-up comedy, or something which uh, associates mm -hmm, itself mm -hmm. with certain kinds of transgressive racist remarks. And it's difficult not to think of figures like Lenny Bruce, who has that same kind of highly masculine, highly transgressive racism. Um, and coming from Britain, where that paradigm has been the primary voice of racist sentiment in the public, sphere for at least 30 years, I think, uh, perhaps more so than in America. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how and if and why uh, this figure of stand-up comedy or this, this economy of humor, um, which is itself a very particularized, very masculinized, very racialized economy, um, has become diffused by the internet in some way. Um, whether the internet is an innovator in this thing which we're calling humor, or whether it's a receiver and a reader of this thing that we're calling Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, one of the reasons that 4chan is popular, and as I said, the most popular image board um, in the world, is because of lolcats. Lolcats, as you know, are pictures of cute cats with kind of ungrammatical sayings underneath them, and people love them. They love to read them, they love to make them, and that's where they originated. So humor has always been the currency for that community. Um, when you mention Lenny Bruce, it makes me think of... Um, Richard Pryor, and um, there are other comedians who have disavowed the, the word after using it promiscuously, saying, I realize now it's not a non-expressive word. It is always an expressive word with expressive power, and I'm not going to use it anymore. So that struggle over usage, or um, as Randall Kennedy calls them, abolitionists, right? There are websites called Abolish the N-Word. Um, that certainly predates this. I don't think it's a history these individuals are aware of in any way. Um, but someone like Chris Rock has certainly done a lot to circulate those words, and it's often been said by comedians like Dave Chappelle, who, who claimed to have taken his show off the air because he thought the humor in it was not being taken the right way. Right? The people were laughing at the wrong parts, and he realized that what he was doing was circulating images of race that were feeding racism, at least that's what he said, um, that's always an issue for comedy, right? Representation is a kind of, you know, always has got to be on the edge for comedy to work. Um, I don't take that, though, as an excuse. I, I, you know, I, I take what you're saying, I think that's very true, um, but I see this as, in some ways, intense aggression um, having to do with all kinds of other things, right? I think that, you know, masculinity is at this kind of you know, exploding crossroads right now. And so this kind of, you know, um, trash talking is very much about masculinity, right? Asserting my masculinity over and over and over again, um, especially in places where no one can see me, right? Where I have no accountability and so on. So I think seeing Quentin Jackson with his kind of overt bursting masculinity saying that he was driven off of Xbox, he couldn't take it, it was too much for him. It's kind of an eloquent moment. In your talk, you focused a lot on recreational spaces, mm -hmm. uh, and Twitter is sort of a middle ground. I wonder if in your future research, uh, research, you have any plans to look at things like newspaper comment sections and a space where similar behavior is often applied, but in the context of local news stories mm -hmm. or political um, events. And part of what was linked to that is you sort of explicitly said um, you weren't looking at a legal or regulatory framework to respond to this, and that was what you commented on in the Harvard book. But 
um, you know, there's been work in public health and other fields about what are the consequences uh, that people face, not necessarily saying that therefore we shall well regulate. I'm just wondering if you have plans to apply your research in, in a more um, straight news format setting or, or in Twitter around news stories. Yeah. Yeah, Twitter has definitely really recently become this incredible news source, you know, really important. Um, I haven't been doing, I haven't been thinking of that. And partly it's because I'm interested in spaces that are non-regulated, as the internet once was. Like it was at one time 90% anonymous and kind of unregulated. Now, due to Facebook, I think, and the incredible popularity of social networking, there are relatively few anonymous spaces left. And so Xbox Live, 4chan, Twitter, you know, and not for everybody, right? That's what's there. And so it's, it's just, I really am curious why there's such intense racism and sexism there, right? It's not necessarily the case that anonymity will produce that. So why that's happening, why these are so popular, right? I don't think it's a coincidence that these are so popular, and yet this is how they are. So um, uh, as, again, I think I'm thinking of racism as an instrumental strategy to negotiate an anonymity in these kind of hyper-masculine environments. But it'd be great research to see, you know, what the ongoing history of the N-word is in other public spaces, right? Yeah. Thank you for a really compelling talk. Um, I have a question that kind of goes on the job question about um, irony, and that's, I guess, a question of satire. Um, I was thinking about the enormous popularity of um, an actor and comedian like Stephen Colbert, mm. um, or the popularity of Twitter, where there's this presumed, um, he's really playing the straight man in all senses <laughs> of the word, um, who's so <laughs> making such a parody or satire of the, the conservative politics, where it's so over the top. Um, in his straight performance of that, that there's this um, kind of insider knowing um, where you know that he is mocking these politics and does so, I think, often very successfully um, to point out the absurdity of some of these public policies or other public figures um, or articles that you find in The Onion. Um, and I was wondering if some of this might be um, kind of unsuccessful satires of racist behavior, mm -hmm. or if there's some way where they're aspiring to ridiculousness, over the topness, that kind of humor that, however, is falling flat. And I think even Stephen Colbert knows where certain lines are. Um, so yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about satire and the lack of a straight a straight player. Anywhere. That's a good. That's a really good example. I mean, when Stephen Colbert crosses the line, there's this moment of like horror, yeah. and everybody knows. And then he goes back, right? Um, he was recently on Henry Louis Gates's genealogy show, American Lives, and he found out to his pleasure he was the whitest man they had ever tested. A hundred percent Scots Irish, nothing else. I mean, no one had had such a result, and he thought it was the greatest joke ever, right? The greatest joke on him. So I think that's enlightened racism. But it, you know, that's, it doesn't work all the time, right? Because it assumes that you're not racist. That's the way post-racism is. It assumes that you're beyond it. But if you're not, right, if you're still just plain regular racist, then that's the problem. Like Chappelle was trying to bring people in some ways into a post-racial humor, and some people weren't there. And that was the issue, right? It's a, it's a mode like post-feminism that works if you're not really a sexist. But if you are, then The Man Show is the greatest show ever made, right? And you can consume it in this pure kind of delight and pleasure in that you're finally getting, we're finally getting the real thing. So in some ways, I think this research is about that kind of post moment that licenses all kinds of behavior with the assumption that we're all there, right? And this is very much about Obama and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not moderating it, but anyway, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm fascinated by the, the the difference between what we say at our dinner tables with our families and friends and um, what gets recorded when we speak online. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the conversations um, that you've shown us are things I remember from my childhood. Mm -hmm. And that's just how my family talked. Mm -hmm. And um, 
particularly with uh, your discussion about um, trash talk. Mm -hmm. My cousins play basketball. They are black kids from Newark. That's what you did. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a really good way to, to throw off your opponent. Mm -hmm. And then they would all come home with each other and, and have dinner. Mm -hmm. And so they're incredibly <laughs> mean things said on the court. But then everyone was friends afterwards. And if you couldn't take it, um, uh, even more, a whole other level of ridicule would, would happen. Yeah, then you're a pussy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Our favorite phrase was catch and feelings. Like a girl. And girls oh, have feelings. Oh, yeah, like a girl. And you are mm -hmm. not meant to be a girl. Mm -hmm. You're a man from basketball. Um, so, I guess I don't really have a question as much as I want to say, gosh, I thought I had left that in mm -hmm. And uh, I don't play Xbox. And, and I, when I play World of Warcraft, I play as a single character because I don't like other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why video games are good. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I have to say is public and private, and it has exploded. And, uh, right. Wow. Yeah, I actually have a University of Illinois football player in my video games class. And he talked about trash talk with actual football, right? All the kids in the class played Madden. And they trash talk each other constantly as they're playing the game. And he says, yeah, we are trash talking the football team, you know, but we all basically get along. But that's embodied. There's consequences. If you cross a line, somebody is going to check you or there's going to be some result. Or there could be. There's a threat at any, in any event of there being some kind of consequence. But in online, there isn't. So I think that's what he saw as the big difference, is that trash talk always has to have some kind of possible, you know. Can see their reactions, maybe? I don't know. When you're, in, when you're on the court, you can see that someone it's true. has felt, and you've gone too far, and you are maybe too embarrassed to, to apologize, but you might not do it again the next time. That would be a great experimental study in some ways to ask people about that. Yeah. But maybe it's just the facelessness of it. Yeah. That's a good question. Well, longer question and then a short one. The short one is just if you have any thoughts on um, Blizzard's attempt, I thought maybe as a cure for this to use real names. Oh, yeah, real ID? As in whether that way you thought that would have worked. It seemed to me it was odd how the reaction was, oh, we have to worry about defenseless people who might be attacked if you use real names instead of what you're supposed to address was, as he said, sort of the weakling versus the warrior. Mm -hmm. thing. If you have any thoughts on that. The other question is just on, you said games themselves are instrumental and procedural, not expressive, or are you saying that they, they are expressive? Because one of the things about the games is the, the, it raises the question, well, I've said a racist thing, or I'm slaughtering elves, I'm acting as a pimp, I'm Mm -hmm. Whatever. You're thinking of Grand Theft Auto, yeah. Mm -hmm. There are so many bad things you do in games, and people have distanced themselves from it, and the argument is, well, you know, these violent games are turning kids violent, and the studies don't seem to show that. What, what's the balance between that and the game itself, or is there a problem with the game itself? Yeah, Real ID was really controversial. I think that there were some women, particularly, who thought it would make things a little safer for them, but there were also women who said, look, my team doesn't know I'm a woman, and I don't want them to know because we play really well and no one ever calls me a bitch if I drop something or whatever. Um, so it's controversial. I think ultimately Real ID is best seen as a way for Blizzard to capitalize on their cross-platform games so that if you're playing WoW and um, somebody you know through Real ID is playing Warcraft 3 or Warcraft, no, um, Starcraft, you can hop over and visit them. So it, it encourages convergence between different games that Blizzard already owns and that's why they like it. Because right now you don't have that if, unless you have, unless you have like some kind of authentication. Um, as far as your second question, I think games are expressive. I think what I meant is that they're more than just visual representations. Because people get really, really angry when they say, "Oh, there's um, not enough black people in this game, and therefore it's racist," or "There's too many black people of the wrong kind in this game, and therefore it's racist." Um, I think it's not so much about that. I mean, that's part of it. But what's actually happening in the game is more about whether blackness is rewarded or punished in the game, whether there are skills that you can have as a black person or a white person you can't have as another race, but mainly how you're treated in the game when race comes in, either through voice or through your own um, decision to choose a gamer tag that might express your race or ethnicity. So I think that 
you know, the, I'm trying to correct what I see as this overemphasis in the field and in media studies generally on representations. That if you have X number of black people, it's not a racist show. Or if you have X number of women, it's not a sexist show. And I don't think that's a good calculus when you're trying to understand if something, what something's doing with racism or sexism. So, okay, so I, I saw you first, yeah. down, down here. And then who, who, who has a question at the back? So when, when, when a lot of these uh, terrible things are said online, uh, is there a realization of the fictitious nature of identities, identity categories? Because uh, it seems like because of the irony, because of the, because of the context of humor, uh, there could be such a realization that identity categories are in fact fictitious. So that could be uh, an optimistic take on this behavior, on, or on the other side, do you think that it's sort of the ongoing uh, reinforcement of traditional identity categories? I think you're talking about the teachable moment we all hope will occur in the internet and almost never does. <laughs> um, um, but I think that you know goes back to this issue of you know regulation can occur in all kinds of ways and I think that there are these teachable moments that can be exploited by individuals who are willing to intervene in them in the moment. Because as you know, Jeff Bacalar or whatever says, um, live, the lack of live correction or live feedback is like no feedback at all. Right? If you get banned by you know, Xbox Live for calling someone the N-word, two days later, there's no way you're going to make that connection. Right? Or you might make it, but it's far too late to make any difference. And so um, you know, creating cultures where people can intervene is important. But as I mentioned before, hard because then you're an old coot, right? Because you don't get it, you don't realize. And so you get mocked, right? It's like Susan Douglas says, older feminists get mocked by younger feminists for being hung, hung up about, you know, um, Victoria's Secret. You know, I, Victoria's Secret in the mall, unbelievable to me. <laughs> I remember seeing girls in my campus walking around with the word pink right across here. They don't do that anymore. But I used to see it and think, is that irony? Like, what is that? I just can't believe this is serious, you know? And I'm an older woman, and so I can, I, I can imagine irony, but Susan Douglas is older than me. She's like, that's bad. That is wrong. Like, someone needs to stop her and tell her to stop doing that. But younger women, my students are like, you both are idiots. You know, what do you tell Why are you so upset? So I, in some ways, it is a generational issue of what's ironic, right? And so when you have mixed generations playing in games, it's more possibility for that teachable moment but if Microsoft's going to give those teachable moments or decide what they are, they're not going to happen, right? That's not the way for it to occur. It's not possible. So. At the very back, Justin. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I'm wondering. It seems like there's an assumption here. The premise is that. Racism or sexism is inherently bad. Um, and I'm entering dangerous ground here. <laughs> you got my tail. <laughs> 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 Which is to say, I mean, is there perhaps a need, a necessity for some sort of space where racism and sexism can be performed? It sounds to me like you have a utopian vision, or the ideal would be the elimination of that. But uh, the, 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 the would be no need. Mm -hmm. I, I see where you're going, yeah. Uh, you know, through, through critique to envision right, right, right. the absence of that. Um, you know, I, I, th I think you're answering the question of why it's so prevalent. It's because it is kind of savagely controlled in other parts of life. And so, as you say, it's unrealistic to expect it never to happen anywhere, right? So. There's a lot going on here with performance. And, you know, I don't know, is the simulation and resemblance of gratuitous violence? I mean, once you enter into that space, I mean, the. Anything else seems to me to be any, any sort of uh, imposition of, 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 of a morality that would consider sexism or racism seems to go out the window once you're in that kind of simulation. 
Okay, so how do you, can you can you have your cake and eat it too? Can you have you know video game you know uh, bloodshed and expect that all of these other things are going to come along with it? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> To think that, I mean, this is simulated war, you know? I mean, yes, war often is racist and sexist and gratuitous and terrible, but that's what's being simulated. That's what's being you know, simulated. that's something I, I should add here, actually, that you're making me think of. Um, there are some really strong gay lesbian guilds in World of Warcraft, and there are also some really strong women-only Halo groups and or clans as well that compete on these international teams, and the same is true of Counter-Strike, and they don't use those words. Um, even though it is an extremely warlike game. So I, I don't disallow the idea that part of this happening is about the game. But Twitter isn't inherently a racist or sexist medium. There's really nothing about it that you could say, unless you say you know, owning a smartphone is kind of a gendered and slightly class-based thing. right? Um, but the, the platform itself doesn't really have anything in it that lends itself to one or another, you know, any racism. But it happens. So I think it's really more about what I think of as productively unregulated spaces for public performance that have been incredibly generative for people who are trans, right, who are trying to live their lives as another gender but maybe can't do it in their everyday life. That was the 90s, talking about the possibilities for the disabled, for the differently gendered, for people who wanted to have a different body, basically. Um, I still think that's, that's there and that's present. That's why I'm not saying we need to censor this. I'm not against, I'm not for that at all. I mean, people definitely need to work with race, right? But I think the impossibility of talking about it and the, the really strong desire people have not to. Um, Eduardo Bonilla Silva did some great research on racism. It's called Racism Without Racists. And he interviewed many high school students and they all said they felt uncomfortable talking about it. And all, most of the white students he said felt guilty just talking about race in any way, whiteness, blackness, it just felt really uncomfortable and avoided doing it at all times. So this is a kind of robust finding that says that people generally just want to stay away from it because they feel unsafe doing it at all. Um, when I taught composition in the 80s in New York, we talked about race every day, you know, all the time. And it drove some people crazy. But that was a different moment, right? So I think that, you know, you're right, that it doesn't make any sense at all to disallow conversation about race, but that's not the same thing as racism, right? I think some people feel that it is. That's why they don't want to have any conversation about it. They feel like talking about race is racist, which is why we can't use the N-word ever anymore, right? Because there's no way for people now to divorce it from a specific type of usage, which I think is a shame, you know, and not a good thing, so. They were completely divorced spheres, and that often involved assumptions about who was on the internet. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of lonely, often male, in their parent basement. And so their, their, their real life was asocial, and sociability happened online. But as more and more people of, of more diverse backgrounds are playing games, more families are playing games, these games are playing, being played in their social environments. So I was imagining some of your Halo years, for example being people on the same dorm floor, or maybe even in the same living room, playing, mm -hmm. saying these mm -hmm. things, and also being there in the, the real world, mm -hmm. saying these things, mm -hmm. and hearing them being said. And do you think that, is that part of the problem, that, that, that those spheres are, are overlapping? That's an interesting question. Um, Craig Watkins wrote a book called The Young and the Connected, where he interviewed a bunch of students, some of whom were students of color, in dorms. And they said how important the role of games were in dorms as a way to meet people, as a way to socialize, as a kind of bridging activity to form connections, and that it, you had to play them. Um, in some respects, gamers are interesting to study now because they look just like internet users did 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, there's a stereotype about the basement. Now it's everybody. Now it's a stereotype about gamers, but it is everybody, right? So games like the Wii, casual games, the Connect, and so on, it is bringing everybody in. Um, but nonetheless, you know, there are certainly really robust, large, well-capitalized spaces. Xbox Live is tremendously profitable, 
You know, the connect is yet to even go there. And the we is, is I personally think, going to be replaced by the connect. I mean, since we got our connect, we haven't touched the we once. So, anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Hi. Um, I had a follow-up, actually. I'm not sure if this gets at uh, what Jesse was asking about a second ago. But, um, in, not in terms of race, but in terms of sexuality, I think 4chan is a really interesting mm -hmm. thing. Um, particularly because it seems to me allows sort of the performance or reversal of participation in various sexualities in a way that is truly anonymous, right? I mean, anonymous by the users, uh, users in, a, in a website doesn't mean um, that you're free from sort of disciplinary regulation through the, whatever organization you're using, but um, 4chan, it seems like, actually offers a true form of anonymity and a huge variety of, uh, for instance, pornography of different mm -hmm. types. Um, and there are no barriers, sort of, I guess, identity barriers in terms of navigating between these different types of pornography. So whether or not we consider pornography as a category problematic in itself, um, it seems to me it does allow some sort of um, performance of different sorts of sexuality or sexual education that, that stands in relation to these other websites. And as a follow to that, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about 4chan's institutional structure uh -huh. and the way in which it's distinct from something like Microsoft is, um, and sort of oh, predicated wow. actually on the type of discipline that an organization like Microsoft brings to bear on its users. Wow, that is a, that is a thesis. That's a really deep and interesting question, but something I think Microsoft truly wants to know. Because 4chan is an incredibly creative and in many ways extremely productive group of people who do these projects together, like hacking these sites, and never meet each other, or almost never do. And so it's this kind of dream of telematic free labor. Right? You get all these people who don't know each other at all to do these really hard, complicated things for nothing, right? for no money, except for the pleasure. So I think, as you say, pleasure is very important in 4chan. People will ask for favors, can you put with this, and then they'll say, I'll give you a cat, meaning a cat picture, or I'll give you a picture of tits. They, just, they call it that, you know, I'll send you tits. Um, because the, the pictures roll off, as you say, it's radical anonymity, there's no archive. So when stuff gets to the bottom of the page, it's gone. I think the average 4chan post lasts less than a minute. And so unless you make you know, take, go to real trouble to pull copies off the web, all that stuff is gone. So in that way, it's even more anonymous than old 90s communities, where at least people had a handle and they kept it over time. Um, and there's a lot of research being done on 4chan right now, because it's in some way a bellwether, but also a throwback, right? It's, it's very much like the early, early low bandwidth internet, but also very much about the potential of collective intelligence in a lot of ways. And that's not even a term I like at all, but it kind of, it kind of applies to them. But yeah, profoundly sexist. The, sex, the sexuality there is very disturbing. I hope no one's learning about sex by reading 4chan. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, you know, a readily available way to look at, at, at erotic stuff, for sure, yeah. That was a question. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, and I think it touches on some of the previous questions. But do you, is, is anonymous, in, uh, anonymous in civility and moral behavior, per se? Because if not, what assumptions are we making about the connection between speech and action? Hmm, that's also a deep question. Um, I would say that incivility without anonymity, right, without naming, without anyone owning, um, is in some ways purely an act, right? It's an act because it isn't directed from anyone in particular, in, and in the case of Twitter, at anyone in particular. It's just putting the word literally in circulation. And so I would say it's purely activity. Right? It's not about expression. It's just about act, the, act that the, the act that the word performs, which is horror for most people, right? Horror, oh my God. Um, and then moving on. So I'm not, my Austin is pretty rusty, right? This <laughs> speech act stuff, I remember it from, from back in the day. Um, but it seems that's part of the potency of that kind of racism, right? Is that it's, it's kind of this free floating thing, um, but potent nonetheless, because as you know, I've talked about, the word has gotten increasingly toxic, right? The most consequential insult ever. Um, you know, periodically the courts have to deal with some kind of case involving the N-word, and they always have boilerplate language about how this is probably the worst word you can use in America today, right? Therefore, the harms are greater 
and other types of words. So in that case, it's the word itself, regardless of who says it or who they say it to, that really seems to be the issue. So I think it's the word that has the power, the word itself. So, yeah. I do a lot of work for the U.S. Army. There is a huge amount of racism and so forth in terms of speech, in terms of action, except for some cases mm -hmm. that you're isolated. Very, very little. It doesn't translate into an actual behavior that would prejudice somebody's opportunities, um, which most people consider the most important thing to them. So, and, you know, I'm, it's, it's one thing saying bad words, and I'm trying to get my arms around what that really means in terms of what's important to people, in terms of those consequences. Yeah, the courts have generally ruled that that is an activity, that, that saying the word is an action because it creates climate. And climate creates other consequences, such as lack of opportunity. So even if there's no overt victimization of one person and the use of the word together, um, the use of the word in and of itself constitutes climate, you know, unfavorable climate. So that's that's what they have to say about it. Interestingly, in light of games, I guess you could go and see um, how often the use of racist language correlates to racist behavior. I mean, um, Quentin Jackson said he was killed by his own team and called that. So that's pretty clearly, you know, connected. <laughs> I think he saw it as pretty connected as well. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm yet to know how often those things are matched by actual activities like killing somebody. Um, however, when you're listening to a headset and you hear the word a lot, I mean, that's definitely affecting play, which is where the trash talk idea comes from, is that trash talk performs a job, right? It's not just signifying, it's, it's doing something, so, yeah. Okay, there, I think we have one, one more, time for one more question, actually. Mm -hmm. right. Hi. Um, so, uh, yeah. Simply, if you kind of went, have, have you spent a lot of time on Fortune as well? Um, just sort of to get deeper into it, because I feel like it's one of those spaces where it's a little bit different from the other spaces in that if you go to the B board, right, it's like this kind of almost excessive orgy of transgression, right, in almost every single way. Like anything that is offensive in public ever is on that side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so I'm just wondering if you could talk about that space in terms of like humor. Uh, um, you know, does it sort of go beyond humor? I'm not even sure if people have found it actually funny, but I just didn't know what kind of research you've done on the site at all. That is a really interesting point. And I've mostly looked at B because I'm studying racism, right? And that is the mother load. Absolutely, of racism, sexism, as you say, everything you can imagine plus 10. So um, that's why 4chan is interesting, right? Is that in some ways they have this perspective towards what they're doing, which is very self aware that this is all about excess, right? Which is why we can't mean it. Like no one could mean this. It's impossible, literally impossible. Um, but the history of 4chan was a fan website, a fan board for Japanese media. Right for manga and anime, which is why it's called 4chan because it's mocking. It's, it's kind of referencing 2chan, which is a huge image board in Japan um, from the 90s, I think, and beyond. One of the earliest online communities where people would get together and, and talk about fan stuff. So the manga that they liked in common or anime and stuff. So you're right. Most of four, a lot of 4chan is fan stuff for people who love Japanese media. It's innocuous. It's kind of helpful gives people information about where to get good fan subs and stuff like that. But yeah, B is the thing that's got all the attention because Anonymous does stuff in the world, like they take down the Church of Scientology or they decide they're going to crash Amazon servers to punish the Julian Assange. I don't know where the connection between Amazon and Julian Assange is. but you know, And, and just recently, they've been doing things with um, Egypt. So Anonymous is in the news all the time now. So that's why I'm studying them, is that they're not known specifically for being racist. You know, they're, they're kind of known for doing these other kind of white hat hacker stuff. But they've also harassed a ton of women, gotten their phone numbers, posted them online, 
you know, threatened to kill them. And there's all kinds of really um, kind of awfully sexist stuff. But that's the thing about Anonymous. You don't know who it is. So these things are all happening at kind of concurrently. And that's the nature of it, is that it's all, it's all this big bag of good and bad. But that's the internet, right? That's what makes it interesting. So. All right, there, there yeah. are a couple of other questions. I'm sorry we can't get to you, but uh, we're at 6.30. I'd like to thank uh, Lisa Nakamura for a very stimulating talk. <laughs> Many thanks.